When it comes to financial advice, you got to trust the source. It's why you listen to this podcast. When I'm looking to upgrade my wallet, I turn to NerdWallet. Their expert team of nerds dives into the details to help you find smarter financial products. Before NerdWallet, I was paying for vacations all wrong. (laughs) I was missing out on miles. I didn't even know I was leaving on the table. Now I've got a new card with more miles and more upgrades. What could future you do with more travel rewards? I don't know, maybe that fancy hotel upgrade that you have always been dreaming about. Wherever you go next, make it happen with a smarter travel credit card. Don't wait to make smart financial decisions. Compare and find smarter credit cards, savings accounts, and more today at nerdwallet.com. NerdWallet finance smarter. As with all cards, credit is subject to lender approval and terms apply. Millions of people have lost weight with personalized plans from Noom, like Evan, who can't stand salads and still lost 50 pounds. Salads generally for most people are the easy button, right? For me, that wasn't an option. I never really was a salad guy. That's just not who I am. But Noom worked for me. Get your personalized plan today at Noom.com. Real Noom user compensated to provide their story. In four weeks, the typical Noom user can expect to lose one to two pounds per week. Individual results may vary. The average cost of a wedding is $33,931. That's a lot of dough if you ask me. So let's be real. If you're going to spend that kind of cash, you should do it smartly. But how do you know where to save and where to spend on your wedding? Millennial Money with Shauna Compton Game. It will expand your brain. You're in for a serious treat today. If you've had a bad day thus far and you're looking for a great 30 minutes, even if you aren't planning on getting married or maybe you're already married, do yourself a favor and keep listening. Slight disclaimer, there will definitely be some F-bombs here and there, but I promise you they're all very justified in this episode. Our guest today is Alicia McCormick, and she's host of the amazing Bridechilla podcast. You may have heard of Alicia before. Maybe you're a listener of her podcast. Maybe you heard her on our show. I think it was actually a couple years ago that she was a guest, but she has grown into a dear friend that is across the pond. And honestly, if there's anybody that's going to give us the down low on how to do this wedding thing right, it's Alicia. So I just joined her on the Bride Chilla podcast yesterday talking all things money, and Alicia is returning the favor today, dishing on the best ways to be a Bride Chilla and how to save your cash and where to spend your cash. So Alicia, I am so excited to have you back on the podcast. Thanks so much for being here. Oh, I am delighted to be back. Thank you. And congratulations on your continuing podcast slash world success. Thank you. I appreciate that. (laughs) Okay. So I thought, you know, we have always have fun conversations. So I thought we would start out with with another fun sort of topic. I was playing this crazy game called, which would you rather? And, uh, you know, obviously it's a question that asks, you know, would you rather do this or this? And so this question actually really made me laugh. And I thought, you know what, this is how we have to start the episode. So the question was, which would you rather have a million dollars in your bank account and your dream house or a perfect spouse that met all your needs? Oh, I'd take the million bucks. <laughs> <laughs> Here's why. Because perfection doesn't exist, Shana. I'm always banging on and on on my podcast about this this quest for perfectionism. And I think, well, part of what I love about my husband, Rich, is you know, his quirks and sometimes he can really annoy me, but I know I can really annoy him and I love his guts out. So I think I'd rather have him with these faults and me with my many faults, don't worry, and a spanking house and a million bucks in my bank account. Oh, baby, I'd go crazy. Oh, I'd invest and be very sensible, obviously. 
<laughs> I knew you would say that. I love it. I'm like, you, I have to start out with this question because this is just, you know, and I think anybody who ha- who is engaged or getting married, the idea of the perfect spouse, because that's what we create in our heads. Like they're going to be perfect. Yes. They're going to do everything that we want them to do. And a lot. Life is going to be so picture picture perfect. You know, I hate to burst people's bubbles, but mm. we're all unique and we all got our stuff and life has a way of unraveling. And I mean, how boring. If someone's like perfect, you can just go, what's going to go down? Nothing. I mean, not that we want drama, not that we're asking for trouble, but it's also, I think that couples change and evolve in the seasons of life and as individuals, we all do as well. So I think it's nice to have a little bit of spontaneity and things going slightly awry because then you can fix it and move on together and grow. <laughs> I love it. Awesome. So <laughs> so let's talk weddings. Obviously, we're we're gearing up for the big wedding season here, here oh, in, the, yeah. in the US and you're the host of Bright Chilla Podcast. And so I figured you'd have some good tips for us. So I get a lot of questions from listeners about where they should spend and where they should save when it comes to weddings. So what are some of those common things that that come up on your show? And is there anything that is just like totally overrated that you see others spend cash on where you're like, no, not on that? Yes, there is. Well, look, firstly, I think when you think about weddings, something I try and hopefully encourage my, my lovely listeners and your listeners to do is... Every party and every celebration and every relationship is unique and your idea of a fantastic party might be really different to mine. And that's what a wedding is. It's a love party. But really when it comes down to it, uh, it's been built up as this big thing. But we're serving food. There's probably a bit of jazzy music and dancing and hopefully all your friends and family will be there or maybe not. Maybe it'll be a really quiet day with five people and that's great. So when we're being told you should spend money on this or you shouldn't spend money on this. I just want to put a little caveat here that whatever we all advise, there is no right or wrong answer to this. It's what you find value in and it's also how much money you have. And I know, Shani, you talk a lot about budgeting and and thinking about value for money. And, And of course, that's, again, a unique thing for all of us. But where you place your money and invest your money in a wedding celebration is really important because for some couples, photography might be you know, the thing that they want to really invest in and, and spend all their money on. Other pi- other people are like, we really want a live band. And then uh, another couple will be like, bugger it, we'll just put in an iPod and uh, our iPod's still around. I've just said that. I think that's <laughs> Yes, they are. are. They are. They are. Good. <laughs> well, let's put our record on the player, which is now hipster. Uh, we'll put a cassette in the tape player and go for it. And, you know, it, it's – so I suppose there are lots of different levels of value and where we should be investing our money. However – I do have some thoughts and uh, am I allowed, I've forgotten, am I allowed to swear on your show? <laughs> Go for it. I would like to introduce a concept that I think was probably not around when we last spoke uh, that we can talk about further into the episode, but that is the fuck it bucket and something I feel strongly about, which I think is going to help your listeners if they are planning a wedding or even if they're a wedding guest or a bridesmaid or a groomsman that is helping a friend plan a wedding, this bucket will change your life. I can't wait. <laughs> let's talk about the fuck it bucket. All right. Should we, let's go into let's it. Let's just think... go into it. Oh, we can't good, tease yes. it and not go into it. Yeah. So, Gosh, so I was what... like a Game of Thrones. Like I was just like, I was, I was like a cliffhanger. I was just holding <laughs> on to it. <laughs> yeah. So, so what is this? Like, how do we, how do we use the fuck it bucket? Cause I, okay. I need to know. So the fuck it bucket came from a Reddit thread. I didn't invent the fuck it, fuck it. I can't even say it today, the fuck it bucket, but it was something I read about and thought, oh, that could be really good for weddings. And people were saying this, this idea of a bucket that you can put all your stresses and obligations and all these things that sort of sit inside you and bother you. Uh, and I thought, great, let's think about all the things, the wedding-related things we could put in the fuck it bucket. And I did an episode about it uh, on Bride Chiller, and it took off. And now all of my community members call it the FIB. And there is not a day that goes by in our Facebook group that someone doesn't say, oh, put this in the fuck it bucket. I feel so much better. Or what's everyone else putting in their fuck it bucket? Or can I put this in the fuck it bucket? Um, So 
I the, the episode that I, I sort of kicked it all off with, I just went through a list of all the things that I deem, and again, this is my decision, not anyone else's, that are potentially unnecessary, but also things that people feel obliged to spend money on sure. or get stressed about because a lot of the time we just need to keep coming back to the concept that a, a wedding is also just about you and your fellow weirdo and possibly someone to make it legal if that's what you want. <laughs> and then, you know, saying what you want to say and then having some drinks and cocktails or whatever you want. And that's it. That's all you really need to get married. So all of these extra things that we're constantly being told we need, it doesn't necessarily w- warrant the worry. And of course, a lot of the time people go, I, I, you know, I've read about this in magazines or I've seen it on Pinterest or Instagram and I really want this to, to be, you know, my quote unquote dream day. But I think we do place a lot of emphasis on the stuff and sometimes forget about the feels and that's important. So the fuck up bucket was something I was sort of thinking about extra things that uh, none of your guests will leave going, oh, why didn't they have chair covers? I don't understand where the chair covers were. Like no one, unless the wedding is an abomination. And even then they won't, if it's an abomination, they're going to be talking about that. Uh, No one's going to leave going, did you see the naked chairs? I can't believe it. (laughs) Where were the chair covers? So I have this thing where I say, fuck chair covers, because I mean, look, who cares? Like, and also at five bucks a pop, add that up. That's money that you could be putting into, you know, savings or upgrading your champagne. So uh, I started this list. So, you know, things like uh, gifts, we are obsessed with gifting and my, I I call it the wedding Illuminati, Shana. This is just my idea of the industry that are all sitting around a big sort of, you know, big table in a cave somewhere going, here's what we're going to do. We're going to pressure everyone into thinking they need to gift everyone at any point in the wedding planning stage. That's what we'll do. Release the Pinterest posts. And so then people are like, what do I, you know, I see it all the time in our community. What do I get my mother-in-law on the day of the wedding? And I'm like, what the fuck? Nothing. Going on? What? Why is she getting a gift? Uh, so there's this pressure to buy and bridesmaids proposal gifts and, oh, God, it's exhausting. So I say throw extra gifting in the fuck it bucket, even to the point of giving your partner a gift. You're giving them your love and commitment. That's a pretty freaking great gift. So, you know, don't feel obliged to buy watches or Maseratis or whatever people give each other on wedding days. Maserati. I I, I where do I, I where do oh, I, I sign don't. up for the Maserati I, one? <laughs> I mean, maybe they've got it on the lease. I just pulled that one out. I don't know where. Who's giving people cars on their wedding day? Someone. Definitely. I'm sure. Yes. No. No judgment. <laughs> no judgment attached to that. Sure. As long as you're doing it responsibly. Um. Good for you. Hey, we all want a Maserati, do we? I don't know about insuring it. It would be annoying. Yeah, I think that, yeah, I I think in theory, you know, or in practicality, I probably wouldn't want the Maserati, but I'm just curious, (laughs) like, you know, could you imagine like your, you know, your future spouse like rolls up and there's your gift and it's got a bow on it? I mean, it's like, um, you hear like pumping the petrol, the gas. Exactly. Yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure that happens in California. I would put, I'd put money on that one. It feels very Real Housewives and I'm a fan of the Real Housewives. So, um, if anyone, if anyone's given their spouse a car, call in, send us a message. We would like to know about it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it's so funny because I've been married twice, so um, not that that's certainly something to um, to to tout about. However, really, the second time it was like, okay, I get it. Mm-hmm. Like, this is about the marriage. Yeah, we want to yes. have fun, and yeah, we want to have an awesome day, and yeah, I wanted to have that moment where I felt really beautiful and special and amazing. And I don't think you can ever, especially being a chick, you can't ever separate yourself from that because that's just a moment you really want to have. But there is or there was this awareness of, okay, this is really about two people and we're going to have many, 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 many years together. So let's just have fun, but let's not put too much pressure or too much stress, or even for us, it was spending too much money. There was way, so many other things we wanted to do with money. Uh, but let's just have a good time. And I think that that 
going into it with that sort of awareness or thought helped so many things not be stressful or so many things we could just laugh at if something went wrong. Oh my gosh, everyone should plan their first wedding like their second wedding. That should be like a tagline. I think you've just just knocked it on the head there. Yeah. It's amazing. I think yeah. I think I've just given you your new uh marketing tagline. <laughs> Gosh, I'm, I'm thinking of book titles already. Oh my gosh! <laughs> so another item I, that I would think might go in the in the fuck it bucket. I mean, what about those? All that pressure to invite those guests that either you yes. don't know or your 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 parents or friends with, and every time you add another guest, you're adding another expense on top of things. So, like, how do you deal with that? How do you politely say no or? What do you do in those situations? So I think I call them obligation guests and everyone has a different version of obligation guests. It could be someone from work that is like, so what, when's my invitation arriving? You're like, oh, fuck, Gary, fine, just come along. I hate you, but you can come because I can't deal with you for 12 months. Gary shouldn't be coming to your wedding. So I have a rule that is pretty simple. My thing is you should never have to fake smile on your wedding day. So if there is someone that is on your wedding guest list that you think, I don't like her, but my mum wants me to invite her because she went to bowls with her at something, I don't know how old mum is, tennis, and she thinks she should come. And if you don't think someone should be at your wedding because they don't make you feel good, that's my first rule. They should not be on the list regardless of any emotional obligation uh, parental right. blackmail, whatever. So firstly, go through your guest list and really cross off those people that don't give you the good feels in the Tums. The other thing is uh, you can sometimes make, I, I make a lot of, it makes me sound like I'm an alcoholic, but drunk promises. And this comes from like college <laughs> or I get really generous when I've had a couple of wines. I'm like, you can come along, you can stay at our house. And then my husband's like, what the fuck are you doing? Shut up. Stop <laughs> promising things. Um, so we've all made promises, oh, and not necessarily, it doesn't have to be alcohol related, but you know, things slip and you're like, oh, I don't really necessarily want them to come along either. Sure. Or, I went to their wedding, so they shouldn't automatically come to mine, which I think yes. is also something we should all just ditch because, yeah, you might have gone to their wedding five years ago, but you haven't spoken to them more than three times over that last five-year period. You don't know the names of their kids or where they currently live. Then, no, they should not be coming to your wedding. There's a lot of attachment to this this onus of obligation. And I think as soon as we can start to rid that or at least shake it off a little bit, it can really open the door to reducing the number of people. And also just thinking about the atmosphere, how many actual seats you have in your venue is a really good one to cut back um, numbers. Some venues say, we've got a hundred table, hundred seat limit, and that is it. We're not insured for any more. That's the amount of people that you can bring. So then that's a restriction as well. It's just a tricky one and part of it is just sitting down with your partner, not the parents yet, sit down, make your rough list, really work through what sort of vibe you want at your wedding and also then if your parents are contributing funds, I call them wedding donors <laughs> and it's like, you know, parents can be like political donors when it comes to to, to planning weddings because we all know that Political donors say, hey, here's some money. I believe in your cause. I don't really want you to do anything. And then as soon as someone comes uh, into, you know, gets the, wins the seat, they're like, by the way, I need you to do everything. I didn't say I wanted you to do, by the way, this is all for me now. So sometimes parents can be a little bit like that. They're like, yay, you're, we're so excited. You're getting married. He's 10 grand. Um, we just want you to enjoy it. And then <laughs> they start to say, oh, actually, we need you to invite 17 extra people you've never met. And you're like, what the fuck's this? You said there were no extras. But because they're your parents and because they chip away at you, you feel obliged to do it. And especially if they're your in-laws and you're like, oh, I don't want to rock the boat and start our relationship off in a way that's, you know, me being prissy, but I don't know those people. So it's a very delicate balance, Shana. I could talk about this for 70, 70 hours and still not have a good answer for you. I'll breathe now. Financial anxiety, anyone? Yeah, you're not alone. But worrying about it, it doesn't help. Earnin does. Earnin is an app that gives you access to your pay as you work up to $100 per day or up to $750 per pay period. You just download the Earnin app 
and verify your paycheck. Then you can access up to $100 per day as you work and leave an additional tip. Any money you access plus tips are automatically repaid from your next paycheck. So how would you spend the money you get from Earnin? Well, honestly, my hubby and I have been feeling a little bit disconnected lately. That's what happens after you've been together about 12 years. So I would spend the money on a special date night with dinner and maybe bowling, you know, to bring back some of that giggly excitement that we both felt at the beginning. Make Earnin a part of your financial routine and join Earnin's over three and a half million customers who say things like, when I think about Earnin, I think about financial stability, security, gives me a lot of peace of mind. Download Earnin today, spelled E-A-R-N-I-N, in the Google Play or Apple App Store. When you download the Earnin app, type in Talkin, T-A-L-K-A-N, money under podcast when you sign up. It will really help the show. Talkin money under podcast. Subject to your available earnings, location, daily max, and pay period max. See earnin.com slash TOS for details. Earnin is a financial technology company, not a bank. Bank products are issued by Evolve Bank & Trust, member FDIC. Listen, if you've been using Mint to manage your money, I have got some news for you. First, the bad news. As you might know, Mint is shutting down for good. But the good news? Well, there is a way better alternative that is a personal favorite of mine, Monarch Money. And I'm not the only lover of Monarch Money. Many Mint users are turning to Monarch Money and just raving about it. I used to manage my money with an Excel spreadsheet. I know, so archaic. And it was so time consuming. I tried all of the apps. But I just didn't find one I liked until I found Monarch. And I've got to tell you a secret. Monarch is so easy to use with a very intuitive design. You can even collaborate with your partner and you can customize Monarch for whatever your needs are. Monarch is the top rated all-in-one personal finance app. Gives you a comprehensive view of all your accounts, investments, transactions, and more. Create custom budgets, set goals, and collaborate with your partner. And now get an extended 30-day free trial when you go to monarchmoney.com slash ETM. Let's go back to the collaboration bit. Because we know money is a leading cause of divorce and breakups, Monarch has built-in collaboration features so you can invite your partner at no extra cost. You can see all your finances, make a budget together, get insights on your cash. Yes, cue the confetti. There will literally not be any more arguments over money. And if you've been frustrated with personal finance apps that are cluttered with ads, difficult to use, or rarely updated, so was Monarch. They built a new kind of personal finance app that's intuitive and powerful ad-free, and constantly improving based on customer feedback. Monarch has a tool that allows you as well to easily import your data from Mint. You can keep all of your tags and all of your categories. After trying Monarch for myself, I understand why it's the top-rated personal finance app. And right now, get an extended 30-day free trial when you go to monarchmoney.com slash ETM. That's M-O-N-A-R-C-H-M-O-N-E-Y dot com slash ETM for your extended 30-day free trial. For the ones who work hard to ensure their crew can always go the extra mile. And the ones who get in early so everyone can go home on time. There's Grainger. Offering professional-grade supplies backed by product experts so you can quickly and easily find what you need. Plus, you can count on access to a committed team ready to go the extra mile for you. Call, click Grainger.com, or just stop by. Grainger. For the ones who get it done. Want to know the number one money question I'm asked? It's how to get started investing without being overwhelmed. So if you're asking yourself the same question, then you have to check out the Investing for Beginners podcast. The hosts, Dave and Andrew, they break down investment terms and strategies in a way you can finally understand. I love that they're making investing accessible and they have an entire podcast dedicated to helping you invest better. Even if you're not ready to start investing, they explain the stock market and financial updates so you can really understand what is being said on the news. If you're ready to learn more about investing, I'd recommend you start with two of my favorite episodes. Listener Q&A, how do you start investing with a thousand bucks, where they explain how you get started right away, and back to basics of building your portfolio, where they explain how to build a portfolio from scratch. The Investing for Beginners podcast is a great way to start expanding your relationship with money. Find Investing for Beginners podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Everyone knows that putting money aside in savings is really important. But then what? Should you keep your savings locked in a CD for a higher rate or keep them liquid in a money market? Can your checking account help you save too? 
Or is it about creating the right combination? We believe real banking is a conversation. Let's talk about the savings options that are right for you. Learn more at sandyspringbank.com. Member FDIC. It is tricky. I mean, it, I just, when you were saying this, I just have to share this story. It's, uh, it's just sort of a funny story. So speaking of in-laws, in-laws are tricky. I mean, let's just be honest. Regardless yes. of who we are, the in-law thing is, it's a little, and there's certain in-laws that want you to call them mom and dad. And some people feel a little weird about that. Some people love that. I mean, everybody has a different relationship with, with in-laws. But at, at my wedding with Jeff, uh, there was this funny moment. We got married uh, in the, in the, backyard we lived in this condo that was near the beach and our backyard was just sensational and we got married there and we had all the chairs set up and of course I'm in the back room uh just waiting obviously to come down the aisle and my mom comes just barging in and she's like you're not going to believe what just happened i'm like uh -oh. what you know and i'm thinking something terrible has happened <laughs> and she's like well i put my purse down on the very first chair and i came back and do you know what jeff's mom moved my purse back uh -oh. to the second row and i mean she was just livid i'm like well go get your purse and move it back to the first row like two can Hell play yeah. at this game <laughs> So, I mean, I think it just, you know, that's just another reminder that that I think family can really rile you up at a, at a wedding. Yep. And you're right. Like, if you haven't had that time with your future spouse where you've really gotten on the same page about things, but then also have those moments in the wedding when it's like, who cares or figure it out or yeah. you know, because it really is like you're there to have a good time. And if you go into your wedding and you're stressed and you're not going to have a good time, you've totally defeated the whole purpose and all the money you've spent and the time. So it really it does need to be something that that you enjoy. Oh, absolutely. And I think the whole concept of planning a party should be enjoyable. And look, my big tip coming back to parents because the solution, you know, I said I don't have a solution, but the solution with when you're talking about money and parents and them, you know, putting their two cents in about who they want and what they want to be happening, the easiest thing you can do, and I know we've talked about this before, that it can be uncomfortable talking about money, but if they are offering you a certain sum of money, have a little family conference and sit down with them at the beginning and ask them what their expectations are of that money. You know, maybe one parent's sort of saying, I want to buy your wedding dress. And, and the other parent's like, I want to pay for catering. And you go, great. These are where, this is where your money's going. You can, we will include you in a conversation about these specific items or tasks. And then they are like business managers. You know, you can report back to them. Don't give them too much power. <laughs> but then also treat you know treat them with uh respect and and good communication but then also keep them a little bit at arm's length if you know they're going to be meddling or trying to micromanage or whatever but if you can say it from the get go and be really honest and warm and and I'm not saying when I say treat them business like I'm not saying be a jerk about it but also it's cash they're making an investment and they want to know they're going to get a return like the wedding donors but also if you say, is this is this about guests? Do you want people to come, you know, because we're having an intimate wedding and we're going 50 people and we can't have 17 people from your tennis club. It's just not going to work. <laughs> so if you, if you say it in a really nice way, then they can't come back three weeks before the wedding and go, where's Phyllis? Why isn't Phyllis on the guest list? And you're like, fuck Phyllis, she's not coming. <laughs> she doesn't have a good backhand anyway. Ah, oh, screw her. You're just trying to impress her because I'm fabulous. But just send her a card with my picture on it later on. That's what you want to do. You, you know, I think parents also want to show you off and that's fantastic. And parents also feel an obligation to then invite, invite second cousins and people from work and all this stuff. And you go, this is not a show day. This is my wedding. Let's just make sure we're inviting people for the right reasons. Yeah, that makes sense. So what are the things like what other advice would you give couples who are who are newly engaged of how they can get on the same page or, or initiate some of these conversations? Like, do you have yeah. any conversation starters or like things that they should really be talking about? It's interesting because I think a lot of people come into wedding planning going, well, my dream day is this and I my dream day is this. And then they never talk about it. And then 
especially, and I don't want to gender this, but I, I will just say a lot of my bride chillers say, well, my partner, who happens, you know, when they're sometimes gentlemen, say they're not getting involved, they're not interested. And sometimes you have to rewind and say, if you come in, if you're, you know, a one-man band, a lady band, uh, coming in with your vision and your direction and you've never really sort of said, hey, Brian, what is it that you see when we think about our wedding? which is a team effort, celebrating our love, our mutual things, what is it that you see? And if you just come in sort of saying, well, my vision since I've been seven is blah, 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 blah. Well, Brian's going to go, screw this. I, she's got a vision and I'm just going to not butt in and bother. So I think initially I am um, – in, in one of my book, in the field, I've got written a book called The Field Guide, and what, the first sort of page of The Field Guide is saying, here's seven, seven or eight questions to ask your partner. Sit down and have a wine and ask each other these questions, and then you'll know what your expectations are about the wedding day. So maybe Brian really wants to have a kick ass live band, excellent top top rated wine and he also wants a magician brian loves magic <laughs> uh fuck brian good on you um and then you know and then maybe stacy really wants to spend 10 g on a dress good luck stace um and f- dreams of getting married at niagara falls and also wants a magician so then you go okay well how do we make this work for our budget but also thinking about a theme and then you know how many people do we want there so if you can start out as a team because you're going to end this thing as a team, hopefully. You know, you come out of it married. That's the best team you can be in. Um, then you must start as a team. So I say, you know, whether you buy my book or you just sit down and come up with five questions yourself or whatever, uh, have the conversation. And it is never too late to have that conversation. If you feel like your partner's not as invested as you, especially in the details, then maybe you need to figure out why. And maybe it's because they don't give a shit because you haven't involved them. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think that's Ouch. the reality talk. You know, uh, a lot of couples that, that come to me about having money issues, it's the same thing. Well, have you yes. sat down and asked yourself some of these questions and just had a conversation? You're not, you're not preaching or you're not judging the other person. You're just trying to figure out well, what's important to them. And, and this is sort of what's important to me. And can we find, you know, do we both like the magician theme? Like, can we make that work? <laughs> I mean, is that going to be our thing? You know, it's the pen and teller wedding. Yes, it's going to work. Let's make it happen. Exactly. You know, I think it's just it's we're so innately most of us, I would say, is are innately fearful of having these conversations with our spouse or the person we're going to marry, and yet we're going to have so many difficult conversations over our lives that this should be a fun conversation. Yeah, if you can't talk about color schemes a budget for a caterer and if Phyllis is coming, then I think you really need to pause uh, because there's, you know, winter is coming. That's two Game of Thrones references today. Um, It is coming. So you need to prepare for the rest of your life together and that's working on more challenging questions. As you said, financial, uh, you know, we're all going to have ups and downs. People are going to die. People are going to be born. You're going to buy houses. These are challenging things. You're going to have joys but also – it's a roller coaster, man. So I think, you know, if if you if you can't sort of get onto that sort of space and also it's about listening. <laughs> you can't just have this conversation and go, Well, I've got my plan. I've asked Brian. He said he's bit, but we're going back to my plan. That's not gonna work. So you need to commit to going, let's sit down, have a wine or a vodka or a cup of tea, and really listen to each other and then really make some decisions about how that's going to roll. And also, if we're talking about money, which is important, some people's expectations of a wedding budget versus their partner's expectations of a wedding budget can be really different. And we talk a lot about sticker shock in the wedding industry and how it can be very surprising that when you start to get quotes for things, you know, the people are always bitching about this markup for the word wedding. And I truly believe that doesn't exist because when you look at a four-tiered wedding cake, where else are you buying that? No one's buying four-tiered right. wedding cakes in real life. So it's bullshit to then go, the wedding industry is just overcharging us. So, you know, if you don't want to buy a quote-unquote wedding cake, go to Costco or buy go to the baker and ask them to cook a normal cake. Um and do that. So, I mean, and you know, wedding dresses, that's a certain niche of uh, 
dress design and uh, you're going to a wedding dress shop, yeah, they can charge you whatever the hell they want to charge you because it's a wedding dress. Whereas you can go to Nordstrom's and you can buy ivory cream, whatever dress you want uh, that's not listed as a wedding dress save some money. So you have to be able to to discuss how much, you know, you think is a reasonable amount of money and how much your partner thinks is a reasonable amount of money and come to a conclusion and then also be willing to adjust that as you start to figure out how <laughs> expensive this thing might actually be or inexpensive. Yeah, my gosh, that's just like such great advice. And I feel like we could talk forever about this subject and you are just such a hilarious guest. I love having you every oh, single time, <laughs> but I'd love for you to tell the listeners where they can go to check out the Bride Chilla podcast, where they can go if they want to get the field guide, where they can go if they want to connect with you, like all that good stuff. Well, look, there are many places, but let's just say if you visit thebridechiller.com, that's where you'll read a bunch of blogs. You can link to the Bride Chiller store. We've got a, uh, I've got three books out now, uh, The Survival Guide, The Field Guide, and we've also got a, a new one called The Maid Chiller Manual, which is all about a bridesmaid. It's a bridesmaid guide. So it's, you know, to help your bridal party get into the chiller mindset. So yeah, The Bride Chiller, and then you can also subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Just search for Bride Chiller you will find. And I'm I'm up to, oh gosh, I'm into the 370s now yes. of episodes. Holy moly. Thanks so much for checking out this episode and a big thanks to our sponsors that make this show possible. Remember to subscribe in your favorite podcast player so you never miss an episode. But before you leave, I want to empower you to embrace where you are today, the good and the not so good. And remember, nothing lasts forever. Just keep taking small steps every day and remember how awesome you truly are.